Hello students, in today's lecture I'm going to discuss about wildlife protection and the law. In this first segment of the wildlife protection and the law, the prime objective of this lecture will be to highlight some of the, you know, uh, the laws that we have, especially the Wildlife Protection Act of 1972. I'll set the stage for further discussions because I'll take a few more segments uh, with respect to wild, wildlife protection law. And um, thereafter, I'll also refer to certain case laws associated with it and amendments, of course, which came subsequently. Now, when it comes to wildlife protection, there are several avenues which you should keep in mind because more often we, when we talk about wildlife protection, the first thing that comes in our mind is, of course, the wildlife. Uh, but there are also several other aspects which are related to wildlife protection laws. And this is something where you will find that uh, you know the uh, ambit you know goes beyond wildlife and it goes to several other issues which involves international transnational crime to be very specific now before we get into wildlife protection uh, law per se there are a few things which i would like to highlight here now with respect to the topic that we have you know there was a famous quote by aldo leopold that meant to wise to tolerate hasty tinkering with our political constitution, except without, uh, except without a quorum, the most radical amendment to our party constitution. Now, men being the center of everything, or so-called, they presume to be the center of everything, they have the tendency to tinker around. They have the tendency to change a lot of, uh, you know, composition around them, which involves not just, you know the biotic constitution, I would rather say, it also relates with several political, socio-economic changes. And these are all dependent upon the, uh, these, are all, these are all dependent upon the laws and policies that we adopt from time to time. And when we take wildlife, to be very specific, we regard wildlife as a natural resource. Now, when it comes to wildlife as a natural resource, which is regarded as one of the basic natural resources, since the inception or since the beginning of the civilization human civilization we have perceived it so so when we talk it as a natural resource it, there also lies certain responsibilities upon us to conserve preserve and protect the same because it is equally you know required for coexistence of the entire mankind so it becomes an integrate an integral part of the entire ecosystem when i'm saying it i mean the wildlife and as you all know that, uh, you know, when it comes to the ecosystem itself, it is a complex biotech communities. It's, it's a complex biotech communities all together in one. And they are all interdependent in each other. And this is not just what I'm saying. Even the honorable apex code of our country in state of Bihar versus Murad Ali Khan reiterated that nature is a complex biotech communities of which man is an interdependent part so man is just a part of it it's not the center of it now taking its uh, so-called inspiration in fact if you remember in one of the previous lectures i did refer to the document which is also known as the brooklyn report so called our common future when the world commission on environment and development came up with this brutal report titled our common future even in that the the particular document also emphasized upon the conservation and preservation of biodiversity and ecosystem and when it comes to india we have a variety of the diversity of natural resources that we have all around is pretty much vast and there are several species which exist at the same point of time many of those species are in fact extinct many of these species are about to extinct are becoming extinct so they need a special attention and special care and that is the reason, that is the idea behind which we have also listed them as endangered species. And extinction of several such species will definitely be irreversible if we don't take active measure at this point of time. This alarming rate with which they are, uh, you know, ex getting extinct because of our own actions, because of our human actions, that is something that's a major concern. And that is the reason because of which even the constitution of our country, the constitution of India under Article 48A has provided that the state shall endeavor to protect and improve the environment and to safeguard forests and wildlife of the country. Now, this is a directive which is, of course, uh, significant, as you all know. 
And if you also refer to Schedule 7 of our Constitution, there you have List 3 of Schedule 7, which talks about concurrent lists. There are several entries which, in fact, is related to uh, you know, wildlife directly as well as indirectly. Say, for example, you have Entry 17, which specifically talks about prevention of cruelty of animals. Right. So be it wildlife or be it not wildlife or pet animals, in a way, this is also something covered under entry 17. When it comes to other provisions like other clause like entry 17B, which talks about protection of wildlife and birds to be very specific, then entry 29, which specifically talks about prevention of the extension from one state to another of infectious and or contagious disease of pests affecting men, animals and plants, something which is happening around at this point of time. And of course, besides this, you can also regard entry 17A, which deals with forests. Now, when it comes to environment, this is the Indian constitution, so-called the constitution of India was emphasizes. But the idea was not that it was only confined here, only in the national regime. In fact, in international level also, the matter was of uh, great importance. And if you come across these conventions, which were, in fact, the issues of poaching, hunting, which, in fact, is related to an organized international illegal crime, which is quite... Uh, you know, even from this perspective, you can perceive the ideas over all over the news that you must have read. Those who are from this particular state, they are already aware of. And those who are even not, they have also followed the news that in several locations we have seen the one horn rhino of Kaziranga. Uh, there are incidents of uh, such wildlife crimes where they are poached and their horns are also taken away. And this is something which is a matter of not just national but international concern because it's a transnational crime. And when it comes to such uh, crimes or nature of illegal activity, which is very much clandestine in nature it there requires uh, international cooperation and that's the reason where why uh, the united nations in fact adopted this conventions on international trade in endangered species also known as CITES in short, C-I-T-E-S. And there is another one, con uh, another convention, the United Nations Convention Against Transnational Organized Crime, because in addition to drugs and arms, wildlife is also transnational crime. And wildlife, of course, is a threat which is due to this organized way of dealing with certain, uh, you know, activities, uh, as I which I've already mentioned, clandestine in nature. So uh, this is something which, in fact, uh, if it was perceived way back and after Stockholm also then wildlife protection in the same year 1972 came into force but subsequently also they did realize all these international and transnational challenges and in fact there was an amendment which came in the year 2002 which is a very significant amendment the Wildlife Protection Amendment Act of 2002. But before we get into that, there are a few such legislations which in fact talks about the laws which are related to protection, preservation and improvement of the wildlife. The first and foremost is of course the, uh, you know, the Prevention of Cruelty to Animals Act which came in the year 1960. Uh, well, due to paucity of time, I won't be dealing with this legislation per se, but if time permits, I'll just uh, touch upon it. Uh, but in addition to that, when it comes to wildlife, to be very specific, the Wildlife Protection Act of 1972. Then you have a very not so, I mean, almost a decade, uh, 18 years old, I would rather say almost two decades. Uh, that's the Biological Diversity Act. Uh, although it is kind of very, uh, uh, you know, subject to several fair criticisms, but these are the two, uh, three important legislations that is there with respect to protection, preservation, and improvement of wildlife. And when I'm saying wildlife, it just doesn't, I'll come to that definition part, it just doesn't mean animals, it also covers plants. So there are other such allied legislations also which are, which were in place even prior to independence, even prior to the Wildlife Protection Act of 1972. And these are those provisions, the Indian Penal Code, if you refer to Indian Penal Code, in fact, under the same, you have to refer to Section 47 and Section 428 and 429. So if you go to Section, um, you know, uh, Section 47, it defines animals, Section 47 of Indian Penal Code 1860, it defines animals like as any living creature other than human being, right? And in addition to that, you know, there is no specific provisions related to wildlife, but it defines this term particular animal. And it also declares uh, killing of animals or maiming of animals as an offense under Section 428, 428, which deals with mischief by killing or maiming animals. And 429, 
which deals with mischief by killing or maiming cattle. So these are the two things and the penalty is very meager at that point of time which it was uh, way back in 1860, the Maculay's creation in Imperial Code. In addition to that, there were several other legislations which came subsequently prior to independence. One is the Cattle Trespass Act and Elephant Preservations Act of 1871 and 1879 respectively. These are the earliest legislations which were dealing with wildlife. In fact, the Elephants Prevention Act of 1879 prohibited killing, injuring, capturing or even any attempt uh, for doing the same unless it is a matter of self-defense uh, which of course is permitted or permitted by a license or when the elephant is kind of found damaging a uh, public property house or you mean in cultivation or which is in immediate vicinity of a public road railway or canal etc etc so that is what it is and you must have read a lot about human animal conflicts where these elephants um, you know they enter the human uh, areas and there is clash and we have seen these kind of things happening even in the city of Guwahati. but uh, this legislation came way back in 1879 which also kind of kept in mind the issue of animal uh, human conflict well, I'm using the term animal because as what it is in Indian Penal Code and in the existing legislations, wildlife and all. But many of you might also wonder that this particular term has also been subject to certain uh, fair criticism because from academic point of view, any of them, uh, many emerging scholars all from Europe, uh, even from America, they prefer to use the term non-humans instead of animals. So that is also something which is also evolving in a way that is a thing which where you will find this welfare laws relating to animals are still evolving the jurisprudence behind it is still evolving and hopefully it will take a very good shape in the days to come and in addition to that the indian forest act of 1927 it also included certain provisions with respect to restrictions in certain activities like hunting in reserved and protected forest if you remember i've already discussed about these categories of the forest in the indian forest act right like the reserve forest protected forest so any such restricted activities like hunting and all if it continues in these areas that also amounts to violation of indian forest act so that is something which you will find under section 26 in fact uh, there you will find that hunting shooting fishing uh, poisoning all these things even setting a trap is an offense under the said act so called indian forest act of 1927 Now, when it comes to Wildlife Protection Act of 1972, well, this legislation in 1972, the Indian Parliament, in fact, passed a very comprehensive national legislation, so-called Wildlife Protection Act. And the prime objective, or so-called the aim of this uh, legislation was to protect wildlife, birds, plants, and for any other matters connected thereto, or even ancillary or incidental they are to with a view to ensure that the ecological and environmental security of the country remains intact. So it just not only prohibits hunting, right? At the same point of time, it also creates uh, you know, protected areas like national parks, sanctuaries, reserves. So it also creates protected areas and controls the trade of wildlife products. Now, in order to achieve this particular aim, it has also created several separate and independent authorities to ensure protection and improvement of wildlife. So, in a way, this enactment has been uh, for great importance and, in fact, it has been also made very uh, clear by the Honorable Supreme Court that uh, the right to life as enshrined under Article 21 of the Constitution, it just not only covers human rights, but also casts and obligations upon us as humans to protect, preserve the species which are becoming extinct and to conserve and protect the environment, which is of course an integral part to our right to life. And this was clearly held in the case of Center for Environmental Law WWF, that is World Wide Fund India versus Union of India. This is a case from 2013 only, not that far. So here it was pretty much clear, made clear that Article 21 also includes an obligation on the part of the us so-called humans to ensure conservation, protection, preservation of the species which are becoming extinct. So the Honorable Apex Court, in fact, also declared that uh, these provisions as enshrined under the Wildlife Protection Act are very much salutary and they are very, they are very, very, very necessary to be implemented uh, because they only with proper implementation, our ecological balance will remain intact, our food chain will remain intact, otherwise things will get disrupted. So the purpose of this legislation basically is to protect the wild animals and also their habitats.
and also establish several protected areas like national parks, sanctuaries, and you know, to ensure greater protection for the wildlife. So as of now in India, we have around 99 odd national parks, more than 500 wildlife sanctuaries, more than 40 conservation reserves. And in fact, there are also something called community reserves. And if I'm not wrong, there are four such community reserves in different bio 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 geographical zones. So these provisions like which we will find whether special uh, you know, attention has been given, there are certain special provisions also given for uh, aiming to protect the endangered species in certain areas. And these projects are known as like Project Tiger, for example, then there is this place called Kir in Gujarat, this Kir uh, lion sanctuary is there, then you have this Himalayan musk deer project. So Project Tiger, Project Elephant, Gir, Lion Sanctuary, Himalayan musk deer project. These are some of the special provisions which aims to protect and preserve a special particular endangered species. So that is something which is very much significant. Now this legislation, it covers around 60, it comprises of 60 sections and six schedules. These schedules are quite important because they are divided into eight chapters. And, um, you know, uh, this is in a way, uh, you know, you should also keep this in mind that this is 1972 legislation that I'm referring. In fact, there was a subsequent amendment in the year 2002. So in 2002, a new chapter was also inserted, chapter 6A, which basically was to deal with for future of property derived from, say, illegal hunting and trade. And there were certain such amendments which also talked about cooperative management to conservative reserve management committee and community reserve committee. So these are the things which were also inserted through an amendment from 2002. Now, when it comes to this definition of so-called wildlife, this is something which you should keep in mind. Please refer to section two, subsection 37 of the Wildlife Protection Act, which defines wildlife uh, with an inclusive definition, which includes any animals, aquatic or land vegetation, which forms part of any habitat. This definition is wider in its connotation. There is no doubt about it because when you talk about wildlife with this kind of inclusive definition, it covers animals, plants, be it in aquatic, be it in land. So uh, there you will find this schedules that I just mentioned, one, two, three, four, and five. There are all these animals which have been specified under schedule one, for example, there are a list of such mammals. If you refer to, uh, you know, schedule uh, one, uh, you will, you know, along with the mammals, you will also come across reptiles and amphibians. Then you have birds, then you have insects and crustacea and all these things. So in a way, uh, it has been clarified that uh, these animals, they include all the other species. So even though it, it, the definition used the term aquatic land vegetations and animals, but this animals also includes amphibians, birds and mammals to be very specific. And this was made clear, very, very clear in Vineo Parivar Trust versus Union of India case. This was way back from 1998 and also from this case of S. Jagannath versus Union of India 1997, where this particular term animal also includes was clearly held that even these birds, reptiles, their eggs are covered with the definition of so-called wildlife, sorry, not animal, wildlife or so-called wild animal to be very specific. Now, in addition to that, another definition which is quite crucial with respect to wildlife protection is hunting. You know, hunting is something which is the major challenge. You know, there you can come across several such terms like poaching from time to time, right? But when it comes to the term hunting, it is very wide. In fact, as per section two, subsection sixteen of our Protection Act, hunting includes it's it's a with a grammatical variation and cognate expression. It includes capturing, killing, poisoning, snaring, trapping, or any a wild animal of any wild animal and every attempt to do so no uh, sorry or any wild animal so if you capture a wild animal kill a wild animal poison a wild animal trap a wild animal uh, these are the things of any wild animals or even an attempt to do so so the thing is that even if you don't succeed to capture even if you don't kill it even if you don't uh, you know poison it even if you fail to trap it even an attempt to do so, even an attempt to capture or kill or poison, snar or trap any wild animal amounts to hunting. This is quite crucial. Secondly, if you are taking a wild animal for the purpose as specified in the subclause, which you will also come across if you refer to this particular section, section 2, subsection 2, 16, sorry, there are several lists of such activities which in fact includes injuring, destroying, taking uh, any part of the body of, of that particular animal or the case of the wild birds or reptiles even damaging their eggs of such birds and reptiles even disturbing the eggs and nests of such birds that is something which amounts to 
hunting. So this definition, in fact, is quite rigid and, and, and it very comprehensive. It tries to bring a very uh, deterrent kind of uh, an approach in uh, addressing the issue of hunting. Now, when it comes to um, you know the definitions, which is quite clear of the wildlife under Section 227, in order to ensure the implementation of this particular law, we do always need certain enforcement machineries, right? If there is a failure in the execution, then the entire law will crumble. I mean, the entire objective of the law will fail. So there are certain enforcement machineries as per the Wildlife Protection Act. To start with is the director. The director of the wildlife from, they, they are basically in union territories. There are directors of wildlife and there are chief wildlife wardens when it comes to states. So the chief wildlife wardens and the directors uh, in case of states and union territories respectively, they shall be appointed to exercise the powers which are provided under this Wildlife Protection Act and they can also delegate their respective powers with pri prior approval of the central government and the state government respectively by an order in writing um, of course to any subordinate officer. So, uh, however, after this amendment of 2002, 2002 amendment is very crucial because it also gave birth to something called the National Board for Wildlife. This National Board for Wildlife, if you just refer to the composition of this National Board for Wildlife, you'd be amazed to see because, uh, you know, I, I came across quite a few uh, envirolegal, you know, legislations in our entire discourse of environmental law. But to be very honest, uh, when I refer to this particular composition of this board, so-called the National Board on uh, wildlife animals, uh, trust me, I was pretty much amazed because, uh, you know, if you go to this composition, um, there you will come across not just uh, representation of, uh, you know, certain ministries like Ministry for Environment, Forest and all. Even the Honorable Prime Minister, he is in the board, he is so-called the chairperson of the board. And there are representations from army, there are representations from, I mean, the chief of staffs, defense uh, revenue i mean you name it they have it in addition to the zoological society of india botanical society of uh, botanical survey of india then you know all, all these other agencies which are research oriented and all there are also several other because when you talk about wildlife it's a transnational crime and that's why you have ministry of defense in play home affairs in play and uh, chief of staffs in there and, and this is something which you have to keep in mind that dealing with issues like uh, wildlife, uh, you know, trafficking and illegal wildlife uh, trafficking. It, it, laws can only be stringent if you have a very strong uh, enforcement machineries. So, uh, you know, but coming back to this discourse, this was an amendment which came in the year 2002 and Prime Minister became the chairperson of this National Board for Wildlife along with 37 other members. And when it comes to the states, there are also certain state boards for the same, like the chief minister is the chairperson and they also have 30 members. So 37 plus one for national board and 30 plus one for state board. And the state boards have also been conferred several duty with respect to advising the state governments in management and selection of the areas that is to be declared as protected areas. And at, from time to time also advise in formation of several policies for protection and conservation of particular wildlife or uh, species and also uh, adopt and specify certain plans for protecting the same. Now, in addition to these uh, authorities that we have already mentioned, I've already mentioned, in fact, there are several other avenues which also needs important, uh, important, uh, you know, attention. Now, when it comes to hunting of wild animals, I'll come to these, some other authorities, but prior to that, I would wish to mention that when it comes to hunting of certain wild animals, it is not that, uh, you know, you must be wondering that uh, whether hunting is absolutely prohibited. Well, it is of all those animals which are mentioned and prescribed the schedule, but what if it is required to uh, required for you know research and scientific activities what if it is required if becomes if it if it becomes or when i'm saying it i mean the wild animal becomes a threat to um, human life or even a property in that kind of situation so here what happens is that hunting of certain wild animal despite the fact that they are prohibited altogether but the chief wildlife warden they have the authority to grant permission to hunt wild animal under certain circumstances and for that please refer to section 11 of the wildlife protection act because basically what happens is that there are certain circumstances like for example if the chief wildlife warden uh, you know if he is satisfied that 
uh, a particular wild animal as specified under schedule one of the wildlife protection act has become a danger to human life it becomes or it became disabled or it became diseased and it is beyond recovery or uh, you know if 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 that particular there is this wild animal which of course if it's not killed then it will cause more problem then and at the same point of time if the chief warden is also satisfied that that particular wild animal animal cannot be captured or even translocated or tranquilized in that kind of situation the chief wildlife warden can permit can grant permission to hunt that particular wild animal in addition if the chief wildlife uh, you know wa- wa- warden or uh, chief wildlife warden i mean chief wildlife warden or any authorized officer by chief wildlife warden is satisfied that any such wild animal which is specified in 2 3 and 4 because in first case it was schedule 1 that animal should come on schedule 1 even along with that section 11 also gives the provision for those animals which are mentioned in schedule 2 3 and 4 if those animals become dangerous to human life or life or the property disabled disease beyond recovery and that kind of situation also that chief wildlife warden wildlife warden or the authorized officer um, of course in writing and stating the reasons to hunt shall give the permission and this killing in good faith of any such wildlife animal if it has been done uh, you know as a defense as a matter of self defense um of one self or if of any other person which is not an offense that is also something which is there if you have already studied indian penal code you know those uh, provisions of self defense right but here also we have same kind of a provision but this is with respect to wild animals so any wild animal killed wounded in defense uh, by any person shall be a government property that is also clear in this particular legislation and in addition to that if for educational scientific research scientific uh, you know management or collection of samples or even for you know Uh, you know collection of uh, preparation of say venom which is required for medicines as you all know in that kind of situations or for even um, population management of a particular wildlife animal without killing and poisoning in that kind of situation also the chief wildlife warden can give the permission but you should keep in mind that no shall no such permit shall be granted except with the permission of central government for the animals which is specified in schedule 1 because schedule 1 animals of the wildlife protection act well they enjoys highest level of protection and state government when it comes to schedule 2 3 4 5 and 6 so if the chief wildlife warden wants to give permission to hunt a particular wildlife animal as prescribed under section 11 and if it comes under schedule 2 3 4 and 5 of the wildlife protection act the wildlife warden should get the permission from the state government and if that wildlife animal comes under schedule 1 of the wildlife protection act then in that case the chief wildlife warden should get the permission from central government so in addition to this chief wildlife warden um, you know the state government for the purpose of this act may also appoint wildlife wardens honorary wildlife wardens right and there are any other officers employees which it is which the states may feel necessary further the state government can also for the administration of wildlife and even in union territories they can also constitute something called wildlife advisory board and these wildlife advisory board they basically comprises of a minister who is in charge of the forest in that particular state that minister um, or if there is no minister then the chief secretary of that state will be the chairperson uh, there will be two other members of the state government uh, who will of course uh, be from you know uh, in case of union territory it can have any list of two members of that particular legislature of union territory which is Uh, uh you know required for the advisory board there should be other secretary to the state legislature or that particular government or in the union territory there can be there can be there will be a forest officer in charge of state forest department who will be ex officio member um chief wildlife warden who will also be ex officio member any other member which is nominated by the director of the union territory or director of the wildlife union territory of course and any other officers of the state forest department but they should not exceed 5 and such other persons which the state government is of opinion that they are uh, you know uh, like uh, their representation is required there are certain stakeholders involved sir for example representation of the tribals uh, but it should not also exceed 3 so these are some of the so called members which will become part and parcel of the wildlife advisory board it is also something which will come across under 
and this has been added later after the amendment of 2002 but they play a very significant role in decision making of the state government so in the next uh, segment of the wildlife protection act we will refer to other uh, important uh, you know features of this particular legislation some case laws and of course the amendments which came so i hope uh, you guys are listening to my lectures and you are uh, following it and uh, also follow the easy class website and if i'm not wrong the university has also decided to uh, you know uh, activate google classroom uh, in our nlu assam domain so um, i can also share the materials in google classroom so i believe you're all aware of it or maybe you will be given such notice from the side of the administration so this is all for today's lecture i hope you're all safe and have a naughty so stay safe stay home take care of yourself and your family thank you very much